I want to continue the talk on uh, jhana. So last uh, few nights we spoke on uh, the preliminaries of the of the attainment of the first jhana, second jhana. And last night I mentioned briefly the third jhana. When you attain the first jhana, it is uh, very peaceful experience. And it compares to uh, the ordinary state of mind, that state of mind we attain in the first jhana is uh, very wonderful. In, uh, in order to gain that kind of uh, uh, pleasure, we have to uh, initiate things within ourselves. Ordinarily, uh, people experience pleasure from uh, sight, smell, taste, touch, and thought, and sound. So people have to depend always upon those external objects, external things to enjoy uh, pleasure. And they are most unreliable. They always are not readily available for us to have pleasure. And when we are ready, they are not ready. When they are ready. And uh, even if we gain them, it comes with the string attached. So many other conditions have to be fulfilled in order to fulfill our sense pleasures. And, uh, and still there is no guarantee that it will continually, continually uh, exist perpetually, giving us pleasure. The same object gives a pleasure one moment, and next moment that, that object would not give us the same pleasure. So they are therefore most uh, uh, unreliable. Even sometimes they betray us. <laughs> that is another problem. Any external sense pleasure betray us. Let it let us down. We will not have a most reliable way of uh, enduring that uh, pleasure, that joy, so-called joy and happiness. Say, for instance, uh, uh, we look at the uh, rainbow. It is not the rainbow itself that makes us uh, glad or happy, but the state of mind. The same rainbow may not give us the same pleasure, same joy all the time. All the rainbow itself happens in the same way. The color will happen, will take place, will appear the same way. But depending on our own state of mind, that would not give us the same pleasure. Someone who knows this, when it comes to meditation and gains this uh, first jhanic experience, then uh, he would think, this is wonderful. I can attain it, I can enjoy it, I can maintain it. It gives me durable pleasure. 
it is steady, it never betrays me. Once I got it, I can get it again. So, because the person does not depend on external things, does not depend on the eye or visual object, sound or the ear. But this jhanic experience one gains from within. So one can arouse that inner stability, inner quality, inner steadiness, inner path, whenever one wants it. It doesn't need a whole uh, uh, big 18-wheeler truck to carry it. It is always, wherever we go, we carry it whenever we find suitable situation, we can arouse it. Knowing this, having this experience, the person compares this experience with that pleasure. Experience, we enjoy that we gain from outside. And then thinks, oh, this is wonderful, this is marvelous. This is what I want. And by, however, when one keeps attaining it again and again and again, uh, one may find uh, it is not that great, that gorgeous, that wonderful. Because of, as I said, because of the inherent uh, weakness and uh, grossness of certain factors in the first chapter and then strive to attain the second. And then one would think, ah, oh, this is marvelous, even much better, better than what I had, because this is very subtle, deep, very, very gentle and soft and profound. It doesn't have that kind of uh, 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 weakness, but the first as well as the second can be maintained only when one is mindful. It is the mindfulness that upholds that attainment. We got to be mindful. We got to be mindful not to lose it, but to maintain it. We got to be mindful what would affect adversely this attainment. And we try not to, mindfully we try not to get involved in those things that would affect adversely our attainment. So the mindfulness that balances this attainment. In the first jhana there was mindfulness, but it is uh, suppressed by the gross factors of first jhana. In fact, uh, I, I did not mention one thing, always there are something new to say. In whatever attainment we attain, there are something always new. In the first jhanic attainment, although five factors are mentioned, like initial application, sustained application, joy, happiness, concentration are mentioned, there are unmentioned factors, 30 of them, altogether 35 factors. When we look at the list of factors, there are certain repetitions, there are six repetitions. So when we eliminate the repeating factors, overlapping factors, we still have 29 mental concomitants in the first jhana itself. Contact, feeling, perception, uh, concentration, uh, life continuum, 
attention. Then, in addition to this, there are twenty uh, seven other twenty is yes, twenty uh, these six twenty three other men mental concomitants, which are not overlapping. Perseverance is there, faith is there, mindfulness is there, uh, determination is there, uh, wisdom is there, and so forth. They are not mentioned. I want to mention the, at least by name uh, that there are more than five factors uh, for, when, for, for one good purpose. That purpose is that uh, when we gain uh, concentration, that concentrated mind can use the concentration by uh, directing the mind on objects. And that direction of mind takes place due to the presence of uh, attention. It is attention that directs the concentrated mind on a particular object. And whole retinue of thoughts, mental concomitants, will function together with this uh, attention. I want to deal with that later on. I always keep postponing uh, something uh, in order to get long, get, get uh, other factors. Uh, uh, clear. Anyway, when you attain the second jhana, out of thirty-five, thirty-three will remain in the second jhana. If you remove those uh, uh, repeating factors, overlapping factors, uh, thirty-three minus six, that is uh, twenty-seven. Factors will remain. When we go to the third jhana, there will be uh, twenty-five factors. Out of them, few are mentioned. And other than this uh, uh, jhanic factors, some of the uh, factors of out of those twenty-six. Are mentioned. What are they? Mindfulness, clear comprehension, equanimity are specifically mentioned in the in the formula itself. Now, uh, I want to point out. Of course, when we deal with jhanas. Uh, generally, we deal with jhana separately and mindfulness separately. Mindfulness training, uh, when we teach mindfulness, we don't talk about jhanas. We just talk only about mindfulness. When we talk about jhanas, we don't talk about mindfulness, we just talk about jhanas. And we keep these two separate, unfortunately. We keep tranquility meditation separate from insight meditation. And we say, we don't practice tranquility meditation, which is not important. We practice only vipassana meditation, insight meditation. And we always try for unknown reason, uh, meditators, meditation teachers also, uh, deliberately keep these two apart, insight meditation and tranquility meditation. In the Buddha's teaching you don't find these two separate. Buddha never taught these two are completely separate, two and en unrelated entities. These are one integral part of the whole system. There are many sutras. I can casually mention two very beautiful sutras if you want to look at them. 
When I mention sutras, sometimes people say, oh, Bhanteji is depending entirely on books, on theories. What else is our source? If you want to refer to something, there has to be a source. If you simply come up from something from out of blue and say whatever we, we want to say, who can trust us? Who has an access to the source? Anybody can come up and say, this is jhana. There has to be a method to verify what jhana is. There has to be a method to verify how jhana and vipassana combine together. At least some source of Buddha's own teaching. This is not commentary and material. These are textual material. And our only source, reliable source, is the Buddha and his sutras, discourses. In fact, you know, I have a very great prejudice. I don't trust any teacher who simply try to correct the Buddha and bypass the Buddha and say, this is how I teach jhana and this is my understanding of jhana and so forth. I don't trust that. I trust always the Buddha's words, Buddha's discourses, which are clearly recorded in Pali canons. So there are two, at least two among many discourses for you to see very clearly, step by step, he has explained how we practice mindfulness and how we practice jhana. One discourse, discourse is called Samanya Palasutta, discourse on the fruits of, fruits of uh, seclusion, reclusion, fruit of reclusion, Samanya Pala. Other is Pottapada Sutta, both are in Diganikaya. Buddha explained to Ajata, Ajata Sattu in uh, Samanya Pala Sutta and explained to a person called Pottapada in Pottapada Sutta how a meditator first trains himself or herself, restrain senses, practice morality, be mindful always have clear comprehension all the time. These two terms, mindfulness and clear comprehension, are mentioned in uh, Mahasatipatthana Sutta. And Mahasatipatthana Sutta is not just a mindfulness meditation discourse. It is a discourse on both mindfulness and tranquility. In Mahasatipatthana, under Dhamma Anupasana, what do we see? Under Dhamma Anupasana, we see four, uh, what do you call, noble truths. And the four noble truths, last is the Noble Eightfold Path. The last of the Noble Eightfold Path is right concentration. Right there in the Mahasatipatthana Sutta. So, a meditator begins with morality. Any lay person can practice jhana. Lay person doesn't have to uh, observe all 227 precepts or 331 precepts. They have to observe only five precepts, which is mentioned in the in Noble Eightfold Path. Noble Eightfold Path is the golden, wonderful, basic, concrete foundation, the essence of the Buddha, Buddha's teaching. In that essence, Buddha has mentioned Samma Vacha, Samma Kammanta, Samma Ajiva. 
for an average person to practice. Right speech, abstaining from telling lies and so forth, malicious talk, harsh talk, gossip, abstain from them. Right action, abstain from killing, steal and sexual misconduct. Right livelihood. That's all lay people has to observe. Only five precepts. You know, even the fifth of the five precepts is not mentioned in the Noble Eightfold Path, but it's implied. It is implied. Fifth precept is to abstain from taking intoxicating drinks and drugs that causes infatuation and heedlessness. Including that, average householder has to practice only five precepts. That is a strong, powerful, moral base for somebody to practice jhana meditation, vipassana meditation. There have been many lay people who have practiced vipassana and jhana and attained stages of enlightenment and jhanic experiences, lay people. So, in these discourses, First, we practice frank, what, uh, what you call morality, and then practice uh, morality comes under zeal, eh, morality, and then under concentration, one practice insight meditation first, and clear comprehension and sati mindfulness one must practice. When one practices mindfulness and clear comprehension, clear comprehension in those discourses are the same as in Mahasatipatthana Sutta. Clear comprehension of the purpose, clear comprehension of the domain, clear comprehension of suitability, clear comprehension of non-delusion. There's four types of clear comprehension one has to practice. And one must be mindful eating, drinking, sleeping, wearing clothes, answering the call of nature, and talking, uh, walking, looking up, looking down, looking away. Whatever action, physical action one performs, and that action has to be done with mindfulness, with clear comprehension. And then, from there one can suppress hindrances and attain jhana. If one skips that <coughs> and has not perfected that yet, then one goes to the last step of the Noble Eightfold Path. In the Noble Eightfold Path also, number seven is mindfulness. Number eight is concentration. So the Noble Eightfold Path, if we practice from, from any point, but we must practice all of them, all the eight. We don't skip one of them. All of them we must practice. It is just like, um, it's like a spiral. We keep practicing them, practicing them at one level, and then go to the next level and practice all the eight. Then go to the next level, all the eight. Then go to the next level, next level, next level, and then come to supra mundane level. So we keep practicing Noble Eightfold Path in mundane level many, 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 many times until it becomes perfect and solid and polished and then with that shiny stage, go to the supramundane level to practice it. In each level, we have to practice all the eight steps, including mindfulness and uh, concentration. We cannot take one out of contact and say, this is all I want to practice. Somebody might say, I don't care for anything else. I just want to practice concentration, jhanas. It's not going to work, my dear friends. Not going to work that way. 
it is not set up in that way because it is not going to produce result that way if you want to practice if you either you take the whole package or don't take any of them buy a whole package or leave it that is the thing when you buy the whole package <laughs> you got to follow every step now i want to say all these things in relation to how clear comprehension and mindfulness can emerge in the third jhana it they emerges in the third jhana because you have practiced them earlier and have not perfected them now your last chance come to the third jhana there you cultivate mindfulness cultivate clear comprehension cultivate equanimity in order to make the third jhana real third jhana if you have not cultivated mindfulness earlier clear comprehension earlier equanimity earlier you cannot have them out of blue in the third jhana no way <laughs> therefore we are trying to practice jhana tranquility meditation and locked in <coughs> vipassana <coughs> and we have vipassana elements so in the third jhana vipassana element became more clear than in the second and first and second and buddha said uh, uh, the meditator having done the second jhana as many times as necessary to perfect it and then uh, when you are perfecting it you you find something is imperfectible that is something cannot be perfect perfected so you that is sort of an appendix it gets in your way so you throw it away don't pay any attention to it what is that joy or tranquility why we cannot perfect tranquility in the third jhana because tranquility uh is close to is just the opposite of restlessness no i'm sorry anger opposite of anger anger is something nagging our mind all the time and we have to keep struggle keep you know struggling to overcome that and therefore every time we try to perfect tranquility it doesn't work because anger is haunting the mind because these two are always fighting anger and tranquility you cannot have the perfect third jhanic experience you cannot have that clear comprehension that clear mindfulness that equanimity because equanimity has to be should be able to balance everything in fact equanimity is the factor that uh, uh, arouse our insight our wisdom because uh, it doesn't take side it remains as a as a what do you call justice justice not judge it is not it is not judging judge can become partial but justice cannot it remain just 
And therefore, because of his justness of equanimity, we gain insight. And that is why insight or mindfulness is there, because of the presence of justness. And therefore, with that mindfulness, that justness, we see things clearly, we get clear comprehension in the third jhana. Clear comprehension depends on mindfulness, mindfulness depends on justness, equanimity. To see things as they really are. What are the things you s- we see in the third jhana as they are? are the third jhanic factors exactly as they are very clear our physical mental experience joy and what you call happiness equanimous feeling arise in the mind but mind does not exist by itself mind exists depends on the body It is connected with our nervous system. Whatever happens in the mind manifests through the body, through the nervous system. So therefore, when the happiness, equanimity, becomes very strong and powerful in the third jhana, that manifests through our body. As I said, we even feel the thrill Happiness, thrill is not the right word. A happiness, tranquility, peace, all over our mind and body. Mind diffuses, discharge this happiness throughout our body. And that is what mindfulness and clear comprehension sees exactly as it is. This mindfulness is not the same mindfulness that sees impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and selflessness. This mindfulness directs clear understanding to see what really is happening on our body and mind when we attain the third jhana. Our vision, awareness, Become, becomes extremely sharp and clear and even I must say perfect not perfect but very clear even when we come out of the third jhanic experience our vision our sight eyesight is clearer than uh, normal time the green appears to us greener blue appears to us blue more blue more blue white appears to us more white the sound when during jhana sound is very blur it is just like uh, uh, hearing you you being in a glass cage you hear the sound outside. Very far distant, although the sound is close, you hear it as far distant. Like uh, objects, when you are in the jhana, we cannot see them. Uh, sound we hear, but very blur. When you come out of it, the sound becomes very clear very sharp. Sight is clear, sound is clear, smell is clear, taste is clear, touch is clear, and thinking is clear, feeling is clear, when you come out out of that. And this clarity of experience uh, is the thing that mindfulness and clear comprehension sees as they are the clarity of them. 
clarity of vision, clarity of sound, and so forth. And this clarity, <coughs> of course, is a part of our insight, uh, understand, in the insight and clear comprehension. But in the jhanic experience, when you come out of jhana, with this clear comprehension and mindfulness, uh, sensory objects become very clear and more vivid. So, uh, in the third jhana, three new factors are, they are not actually new, they, are, they were there all, all along, but they came to prominence in the third jhana. Uh, Mindfulness, clear comprehension, and equanimity. Satocha sampajano, sukancha kaya na patisangvedeti. Sukancha kaya na patisangvedeti. That is important to remember. In the previous two jhanas, uh, happiness is, was experienced, but not mentioned as physical experience. In the third jhana, it is said, Sukhancha kaya na patisangvedeti. Happiness also experienced by body. That means physically, physically we experience happiness. And it is a yantangarya ati kanti upekko satima sukha vihareti. So Aryan, so noble one, say one who is full of happiness and equanimity lives happily. Lives happily not only in jhana, but even out of jhana. Lives means not only short period of living, but living uh, out of jhanic experience. Because the happiness we gain from third jhana has a strong impact on our life. It, it leaves its uh, remnants, so to say, its history with us, so that we feel inner tranquility, inner joy, inner happiness, even after the third journey, uh, after we come out of third journey. And therefore, Aryans, noble ones, say, that one who has attained the third jhana lives happily. Lives happily. And then, upekka. Upekka is uh, uh, equanimity. It comes from uh, two roots. Upa means uh, very special or strong. Ik, the root is ik. Ik means to see. Pali words ikkati. Ikshati in Sanskrit. Ikkati means see. Ikshati in Sanskrit also is to see. Upa ikkati therefore means seeing in a very clear unbiased way. So, when the mind is equanimous, it is a very uh, great relief to look at objects, situations, unbiasedly. We won't feel uh, uneasy to take side or not to take side. Because that taking side is not the mental state at that time. Mind remains impartial. And satima, after that, that individual who has attained the third jhana remains mindful. Now, we had been mindful before. As I said, in the, in the seventh factor of the uh, uh, Noble Eightfold Path, we practice mindfulness. But that mindfulness is not strong enough. 
when we practice the third jhana and come out of it, then that is the one, uh, from that point onward, that is, that person remains mindful, that is, that is why it is called, such a person is called Satima. Satima means mindful one. So that is a special name for the one who has attained the third jhana. His mind, he, he uh, strengthen his mindfulness, make it uh, strong, sharp, powerful, and therefore it is very unlikely that he would lose that mindfulness. In his day-to-day life, he remains more mindful than anybody else who practices only mindfulness. Somebody who has not practiced the third jhana, has practiced mindfulness, may lose mindfulness, may become unmindful more often, but this one, who may not have attained full enlightenment, and yet he is a very sure candidate of attaining enlightenment because the person's mindfulness remains strong uh, uh, for during the uh, time out of meditation. And therefore, since he remains mindful, he is the one who enjoys happiness. And that is why noble ones say, he is upekako satima sukha vihariti. Satima sukha vihara means living happily. Mindful one lives happily. I mean, who else can become more, more happy? Only mindful ones become happy. So this one, who has sat in the third jhana, is mindful and therefore is happy. Now the third jhana, uh, compared to the first two, is uh, very superb, supreme uh, attainment. Buddha gave a very beautiful simile to illustrate the third jhana. It is just like a lotus plant in a very uh, cool uh, lake. The lotus roots are in mud, but the flower does not touch mud, not even water. It is above water. It's, the, the significance of using lotus is very, very uh, important to remember. It's a great uh, simile. Lotus is used to, as a symbol of purity. Uh, the lotus flower particularly. Uh, although its roots are in the mud, flowers, flower, flower is above mud, water and mud. Similarly, this one, there are, there are, there are several aspects of this simile. This one, uh, although lives have, uh, in the world with everybody else, his mind, although he has not attained a full enlightenment, but he has conditioned his mind in such a way that he would remain untouched by worldly vicissitudes, although he is not an arahant not fully enlightened person, and yet his mind remains equanimous, mindful. You know, when you are equanimous and mindful, you can let go of all these worldly uh, problems. You can just uh, shun them away. You don't be bothered with those states. And that is why I say he is a wonderful candidate for vipassana meditation, 
and wonderful candidate for attaining enlightenment. Second part of the simile is the word, the, the lotus stalk from the root to the top or top to the bottom is every cell, every atom of this stalk is charged with water, saturated, moist, moistened with water. Buddha said not even one single cell of this stalk is dry. Everything is filled with water. Similarly, he said, when one attains the third jhana, happiness that the person experiences is all over from top to toes, starting from the top and ends in the toes. That means in and out, everywhere, the person feels Uh, according to th this simile is uh, th this simile shows another aspect. It is solid. You know, in the other two similes, uh, first one for the first the first jhana was uh, uh, laundry powder mixed with water and diluted, what and what you call uh, dissolved in water. It is liquid, not solid. Second jhana, a lake spring uh, under, underneath, at the, from the bottom, the, the joy and happiness uh, brings up all the time. It has to be, uh, the water has to be replenished. Whatever water overflows has to be replenished from the new fresh water coming from the spring. The simile doesn't show any solidity, the firmness, steadiness, all the joy and happiness is steadily happening, coming in, but it is flowing out. But in the third jhana, happiness and equanimity is solid. It is inside. It is it's, uh, everywhere, every cell of the lotus stalk lotus tree has this uh, water. Similarly, entire body from top to toes is charged, diffused, covered, filled with happiness and equanimity. Now, uh, from the third jhana, we learn uh, uh, very clearly that uh, uh, th there is a history of practicing. That means we have uh, mindfulness. Where did it come from? Because we have practiced it earlier. That is historical for that particular training, that particular practice. That is a part of our history. We have practiced it earlier. That is why it emerges in here. Clear comprehension, we practiced earlier. That is why it, it, that is why it, is, it emerges here. And now you can see, tranquility meditation and vipassana meditation, in essence, are not two different entities. <laughs> And therefore, friends, don't try to keep these two in two separate compartments, two separate practices. We can combine them, cooperate them, incorporate, incorporate them, and uh, join them, and practice them together. We may start with vipassana and end up in samatha, or we start with samatha, end up in vipassana. Perfectly all right. It, here, 
we can see the way how these two join together, shake hand, bring, become one uh, unit. As I said, uh, uh, in the Buddha's teaching, he always uses samatha vipassana, samatha vipassana. Uh, jitta, the training of uh, uh, concentration is samatha meditation, training of uh, wisdom is vipassana meditation, but these two are always related to each other. With clear, underst- with clear comprehension, uh, we practice vipassana. With mindfulness, we practice vipassana. With, my- with concentration, we use vipassana to see them things as they really are. And therefore, the function of these two, uh, although appear to be different, but they both fulfill the same function. Same purpose. Mindfulness prepares the ground for concentration. And when we gain concentration, we will discuss that later on when we discuss the fourth jhana. When we gain concentration, we use the concentration to perfect mindfulness. So, mindfulness perfect concentration, concentration perfects mindfulness. And therefore, when we look at these two from any angle, both fulfill the same purpose. Both are complementary, not contradictory. And both must go together, work together to reach the peak. And therefore, uh, in this uh, retreat, uh, one thing actually, at least we will be very clear of is that uh, Samatha Vipassana are not two rivals. Samatha Vipassana are very um, sort of a two integral parts of the same system, same practice. I think, friends, um, I must uh, stop here. I will talk more about uh, the connection between these two with for Janik explanation tomorrow night.